the Tennessee Race to the Top Award was a total team effort. And we are proud to say that really all aspects of this community contributed to the success of winning that effort, but well directed, we think, by the leadership of, for education across the state. Um, advocating for Governor Bredesen's first to the top legislation during that January special session was our, was very important, our Davidson County delegation. Are there any members of our Davidson County delegation here? If you are, please stand. They're probably working hard on the Hill. At this time, I'd like to introduce the MC for today's event. Sam Howard is a former chairman of the chamber, but through all the years has remained very, very in integrally involved in the education in, uh, interests of the community. And he is the chairman of Phoenix Holdings and the chair of the Chamber's Education 2020 Leadership Council. Would you welcome Sam Howard warmly? Thank you, Ralph. As chairman of the Education 2020 Leadership Council, we seek to help inform the national community about critical issues facing our public schools through Education 2020 Speaker Series. And for today's event, we are teaming up with Mayor Carl Dean, who is actively on the leading edge of education reform here in our city. Mayor Dean recruited national nonprofits Teach for America and New Teacher Project to Metro Schools. He launched a new charter school incubator he is co-chair of the CEO Champions, a group of community leaders supporting the development of high school academies. And just 10 days ago, in his annual State of the Metro Address, Mayor Dean proposed full funding for the 20, 20, 2011 Metro Schools operating budget. We are very proud of what Mayor Dean has been doing for education in Nashville. This is the first installment of a co-sponsorship between Carl Dean, Mayor Dean, and the Chamber. To begin our program, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our Commissioner of Education. He was scheduled to leave state government on July the 1st to be the Director of Schools in Cheatham County. But with the Race to the Top Award up to our state, Governor Bredesen has prevailed upon him to stay through the rest of the year. Please join me in welcoming the Commissioner of Tennessee Department of Education, Dr. Tim Webb. And after Tim, I'll introduce the rest. Thank you, Mr. Howard. I'm not sure if I'll live to regret that decision or not, but we'll, uh, we'll uh, see what, what goes on here. On behalf of the governor and the uh, Department of Education, I thank you for the opportunity to be here with you. It is a very exciting time. Thank you to the mayor, Mr. Schultz, Dr. Register. Thank you all for, for having us here and letting us be a part of, of this exciting event. What does the um, race to the top mean for Tennessee? You know, it, the first part of the conversation centered around $500 million. And we all got excited about the fact that we had $500 million as we stood in this economic winter we find ourselves in. And uh, we were very excited about that. And we started to think about what, what does $500 million really mean in a $6 billion budget? And at the end of the day, when you distribute that money across 136 school systems and four state special schools, as well as the agency initiatives, it really didn't look like a whole, whole lot of money. Now, don't get me wrong. We're extremely thankful for $500 million uh, to do the kinds of things that we need to do. But as we started to think about what race to the top really, really means for Tennessee, the fiscal side starts to wane a little bit, and we start to think about finally, finally, in the great state of Tennessee, the greatest state in the nation, expectations have changed. Expectations have changed. No more is the status quo okay. No more is failure an option. No more is Tennessee going to find itself 40-something. We are one of two states and the largest of those two states to win the first round of competition and what promises to be a game changer for our nation. 
And ladies and gentlemen, the sense of urgency around that game changing shouldn't be taken lightly because we believe with all of our heart that this is our moonshot. Chris, this is our one chance to get this right. And if we don't get it right, public education as we know it will be no more. And we owe that. We owe that to our citizenry, to our population, and to those children who get up every day and come to our classrooms. We owe the promise of this moonshot to those children. And we're going to get it right. We're going to get it right. When we went to Washington, five of us flew up to Washington, the governor, Speaker Pro Tem Woodson, Dr. Jim McIntyre, the superintendent of Knox County Schools, Tamika Hart, vice chair of the Memphis City Schools Board, and me. And we had to defend our application. And the stakes were high. The stakes were very, very high. But what an honor it was. So much so that I sent an email out to the superintendents across the state that I couldn't believe that I had a chance. Somebody from Hornwall, Tennessee, had a chance to sit in Washington, D.C. and defend the best application for race to the top monies. What an opportunity. And you know why I had that opportunity? Because failure was, not, failure was not an option. It was not an option for me. And Dr. Register, it can't be an option for any of our children because it's the great equalizer. And we sat there and answered those questions with all the pride we could muster and held our breath for two weeks, <laughs> hoping that we'd done the right thing, and we did. And we're so thankful for that because now we have an opportunity to move education in a way that we've never moved before. How are we going to do that? 50% of the money stays with us to do things that directly and indirectly affect every district, every classroom in the state of Tennessee. The other 50% flows out to school districts, and I'll talk about that in just a second. The 50% that stays with us, what are we going to do with that money? It's $250.5 million. What are we doing with that money? Number one, we have had in the state of Tennessee for a long time some persistently low performing schools that have not gotten the job done for our children for whatever reason, for whatever reason. And we can all point fingers and blame anybody we want to blame for it, but the bottom line is we hadn't gotten the job done. We'll be spending some $108 million in turning those schools around in ways that we've never, ever conceived before. Very, very aggressive, sometimes very painful, and oftentimes unpopular strategies. We don't get a second chance. We don't get a second chance at, the, a chance at these schools. So we'll be spending a great deal of money and energy in bold and innovative reforms and transformation in persistently low performing schools as defined by federal definition as well as some state definition. Big chunk of money there. The second bucket. The second bucket goes into the most important resource, and I have to acknowledge a colleague that's sitting on the front row here that represents our teachers union across the state of Tennessee, the Tennessee Education Association, for without their leadership and their support, we wouldn't be having this conversation today. Mr. Al Mance, I thank you and the Tennessee Education Association for all of your support in making this happen. Bottom line, I've heard the governor say it many, many times, and I believe it with all my heart because I am one. We can take all the technologies out of the classroom. We can take all the whiteboards. We can take all the computers out of the classroom. And we put a highly effective teacher in that classroom with those children, and great learning is going to take place. With that being said, and that being the core and the fundamental principle of our application, we will spend a major section of our money, a major portion of our money, on developing teachers and leaders in a way that we've never done before, particularly around the use of data and something that we've never done a good job in doing with our teachers, and that's answering the question of what then? If I know my students are performing, low performing or not, doing, not mastering subjects and material, what then? aimed at those, those types of questions and that sort of analyses and that sort of training for our teachers and leaders. And finally, the third major bucket will be around what we believe to be one of the most important pieces if we're going to compete as a community, as a state, and as a nation, focusing our efforts on setting those high expectations for every student in the areas of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, working in partnership with institutions of higher education, Oak Ridge National Labs, 
and the, and the Battelle Foundation that actually runs the, the Department of Defense laboratories across this nation in Oak Ridge. We'll be deploying a STEM network all across this state that will tra also train teachers and allow students opportunities that never had before in the areas of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. A huge investment in those pieces. Now all this involves tremendous partnerships with higher education, with, philanthropic, with our philanthropic community, and with partners all over the state. And I'll tell you again, that's one of the reasons that we won Race to the Top, was that strong partnership and that collabor collaborative spirit and supportive spirit that we saw as we developed the application and documented the letters of support from Chambers of Commerce, the Urban Leagues, all the way through every part of our constituent base. What, what about the LEA share? $250 million goes out to the school districts. In Metro Nashville, I think I heard Dr. Register saying, I'm sure he'll allude to this again in a little bit, it means some $30 million to Metro Nashville schools. But it's not status quo. It's not backfilling budgets. It's for bold and innovative new things that support all the things that we talked about in the state's portion of the application. Turning around low-performing schools, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and teacher, professional, teacher and leader professional development and growth. Things that they will be doing that are bold and innovative that support those pieces of the application. Those dollars will be distributed all across the state. Every school district in Tennessee will receive a portion of that money They're based on their Title I eligibility uh, formula. At the end of the day, and then also let me say one other thing, developing one of the things that we have come to realize is that we can do all that we can do inside the classroom with that highly effective teacher, but we also realize that there are a, lot, a, a large number of things that take place in that child's life that directly influence whether or not that child comes to school ready to learn. We'll be building out a very robust, very powerful data system, building on the le leveraging some of the data that we already have, but building a very powerful le uh, data system that allows us to take what we're calling a 360 degree view of a child so that our classroom teachers and our principals and folks who have a need to know can be able to understand the kinds of things that are happening when children access the Department of Human Services, Department of Children's Services, all of those things that happen in the lives of that child that may or may not make it possible for the child to be successful in, in that teacher's classroom. So building out a data system is another piece that will come along as a part of the state's part of the Race to the Top revenue. With that being said, and I'm wrapping up because I know we're getting ready for our pound. But that being said, it's a new day. It's a new day. I heard the governor say the other day, and I, and I wholeheartedly agree, wholeheartedly agree. Since 2003, there's been a tremendous re-engineering of the education enterprise in this state. We have one of the highest rated pre-kindergarten programs in the nation. We've talked about early grade, we've implemented early grade literacy initiatives. We've talked about middle grades policy and implementing middle grades inter interventions. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, if we could leave a legacy, if the Bredesen administration can leave a legacy from our administration, his administration, it would be this. The citizens of the state of Tennessee the citizens of Nashville and the citizens of Hohenwald expect more. Expect more. Expect more of government, but in our world, expect, more importantly, so much more of public education. That's the legacy. That's the legacy that we want to leave. So I thank you for the opportunity. It's been a tremendous opportunity for me to be to be able to serve as Commissioner of Education, to get up every day and serve the children and teachers of this state and the citizens of this state, I tell you what, it's amazing, it's amazing. And I quote Senator Kennedy when he gave a eulogy for his brother and he said, I've seen, I've not only seen what public education can do for the citizens of this country, I've lived it. I've lived the American dream. That's what public education has done for me, and that's what I want to be able to provide for every child who gets out of that car or off that bus at that pre-kindergarten classroom or that kindergarten classroom, whatever the case may be, and has that twinkle in their eye. So much so 
that on Friday night or Saturday morning or whatever the case may be, 12 or 13 years later, when they walk across that football field or that stage, they have that same twinkle in their eye, that same love for learning, that same expectation, the same expectation. Thank you for the opportunity to be here, and I will gladly uh, turn the, panel, turn the uh, stage over to the panel. You know, expectations have changed. We got a room full of very interested people in what's going to happen with this race to the top. And we have the top, some of the top participants in that program and developing that program, and I'm anxious to bring them up. If our, if our panel would come up now, and after they have finished, um, then we're going to open it up for questions from you. These are our local leaders who have been intimately involved in this race to, to the top application. And our first speaker will be Susan Bodery, is the principal with Education First Consulting, assisted the state of Tennessee with the race to the top application. Following uh, Susan, Erwin O'Hara is the Education Policy Advisor in the Governor's Office of State Planning and Policy and was the primary contact for the state's application. Al Mance is Education Director of the TEA, TEA, Tennessee Education Association, which is a state umbrella organization for our local teacher unions in Tennessee. And we have our own Dr. Jesse Register, Director of Schools here in Metropolitan Nashville. Each will talk for about five to six minutes, and then uh, I'll come back and we will have a, a Q&A with you. Thank you. Susan. Thank you. Before we get started, I just want to say that those of us who don't live in Tennessee, and I live in Dayton, Ohio, have been rooting for you over the past week and a half and watching with bated breath and calling our friends in Nashville. And just know that the entire country is rooting for a full recovery and was thrilled to drive downtown today and see the, the good hard work going on. So just know that our hearts are, are with you as you go through this. Second, I want to say thank you for the opportunity to work with the state of Tennessee on this very important project. Um, the work that I do is all about education policy. The work that our firm does is about education policy, and we work in capitals all over the country. And Tennessee and Nashville is indeed a unique and, and very gifted place um, for things to happen. There are a number of things that I think differentiate um, the Tennessee application, the leadership approach, the vision that's been shown throughout the process, and I want to address some of that as we go through. And I think there are some really important implications for the city of Nashville to partner with the work that's happening at the state level uh, and also to push the work further uh, because cities and uh, school districts can do that in ways that others can. First, Education First Consulting is an education policy firm. We deal with um, governor's offices, state superintendents, um, chancellors of higher education, and nonprofits, and then also district level um, school work and basically try to help our partners in order to realize the vision that they have and to bring forward solutions and cutting edge ways of doing work that will benefit children. Uh, we came to Tennessee because of our relationship with um, the governor's office that we had grown um, into over a period of time because we both work with Achieve um, in Washington and so we were, we were happy to be a part of the conversation. We dealt not only with Tennessee and helped uh, the leadership team here to develop their application but also worked um, in smaller or larger measure with the states of Oregon, Oklahoma, and Hawaii in the first round. We also were key participants in helping the Delaware team in order to prepare for their interview with the uh, federal government um, once they were selected as a finalist. And right now for round two, we're leading the work in Maryland, which is a first-time applicant, um, also Ohio, which is my home state, and they'll be going at this for round two. Um, and they were very disgruntled that an Ohio girl came down to help the team from Tennessee. <laughs> and we're also working again with Hawaii. So that kind of sets the stage for, for what we're seeing. There are a number of differentiators that made Tennessee not just a unique place for reform with a rich reform history, but also differentiators that made it possible, important, and compelling that Tennessee won the race to the top in the first round. I think it's fair to say that most of us in the education reform community were fairly shocked first that there were 16 finalists. We thought that was quite a lot given what Secretary Duncan had communicated previously, but even more shocked when we found that there were only two states being awarded in the first round. Um, 
there were a lot of states um, who came in numbers three through 10 who were equally shocked um, and are redoubling their efforts in order to uh, win what Tennessee now has um, during round two. But truly, Tennessee distinguished themselves from the very beginning. Um, you engaged um, in the conversations around what does this mean and what is Tennessee's vision for education very early on uh, in the summertime. Tennessee partnered in ways with internal and external organizations that is like nothing I have ever seen. This state um, put together a leadership team that ran across parties, that ran across agencies, that embraced philanthropy, that embraced business, and left no stone unturned. While that might be a way of doing business in Nashville and in Tennessee, I can tell you it is not the way of doing business in many states around the country. And so while it seems second nature here to make sure that all hands are holding each other's in order to do the right thing in education reform for students, and I'm not trying to say that it's easy because there are some very hard decisions that were made along the way, um, it's not second nature, and many states right now are struggling to even reach across the aisle from one legislative party to the next um, in order to make the changes necessary or even to agree on what some of those important changes need to be. So you should be very proud of the way um, Tennessee conducts itself in these instances. It's just that spirit of collaboration, um, of bringing those kinds of people together um, as a leadership team but also reaching out beyond your state borders to find what is the best. What can Tennessee not only lift up from the ground um, that works well for children, but what can Tennessee reach out to to bring best in practice into the state that I think was a huge differentiator and one of the big reasons that you had a victory here. Uh, I say that because in Memphis, in Nashville, um, there has been a willingness and an eagerness um, to, to do more for children regardless of what that meant. It's a whatever it takes attitude to help teachers to improve their practice, um, as well as to go to those cutting edge organizations who might do things a little bit differently um, to see what can be learned from them and how they can partner with traditional educators. So new leaders for new schools, um, the, the charter school incubator, things of that nature really do differentiate Tennessee um, in a way that is unusual. And I think you should pat yourselves on the back for that. Um, another differentiator for Tennessee is the long history that you have of value added data a highly developed data system while others across the country were saying we are going to build a data system, we will create a value added measure to understand student growth, we will do all of these things and connect our systems. Tennessee already had that. You had a history of using those kinds of tools and research and for um, understanding where your students are and now you've proposed an innovative and important way to help educators to use that data to grow student learning in very real ways. That, again, uh, was a significant differentiator. There are um, a number of states across the country that share some characteristics of Tennessee, being a good mix of rural students and urban students. Uh, but many across the country did not address um, the rural students and really only relied on urban student um, support systems going forward in their applications. And Tennessee made a commitment to both. Yeah, that's vitally important because not only do you need commitments in our urban communities, but also in our rural communities, and when it gets down to the nuts and bolts of doing the work, those solutions can look very different. And so that has been um, important along the way. I think at the end of the day, what really made the difference for Tennessee is the fact that you did not approach this as a way to get money. You did not approach this as another grant to win or something else to write to get to the right answers. Tennessee approached this from the perspective as what is best for the future of our children and the future of our state? What is our vision? And then does Race to the Top help us to accomplish it? Now, I'll be very honest, we have lots of conversations about, you know, leave no points on the table, make sure that it is highly competitive. I can't tell you how many times the governor would look at me and say, is this gonna do it for us? Are we going to get the points on this one? Um, but at the end of the day, it's Tennessee's vision for Tennessee's children as animated by federal government dollars. That makes all the difference in the world. Um, from our perspective at Education First, we've been very proud to be a part of this work. Our role really was to bring solutions, to push the thinking, to try to get into a more detailed space of what would implementation look like um, once Tennessee would win. 
Um, and we've been privileged to have that conversation with people of open minds who have a distinct understanding of the students of the state and a very high value of the teachers who live and work here. So thank you very much. Um, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this team. And go Tennessee. The commissioner has actually already stolen my two favorite um, governor's statements related to both uh, teachers and expectations, but those are the two things that for the governor have really um, led this effort and driven it, which is that the teacher is the most important person um, that a student will deal with in their life and the person who will change education for the state, and also that his goal is to leave the state with expectations higher for government um, and for public education than when he started the work here. Um, and then Susan stole the other part of my speech, which was about <laughs> that we had, um, that this, when, when we've been asked the question in other places, and um, Dr. Webb and I traveled out to um, Minneapolis to present to all of the states who are applying for the second round of Race to the Top, of the race to the top um, competition, um, and there was a bit of trepidation there. Um, worried that, uh, that people would look at us and want to throw tomatoes or something of that sort. Um, but really, people were um, were cheering us on and, sa and said, you know, well done, way to write a great application. But really, more importantly, how did you get to a point where you had gotten all of this collaboration in place, where um, you had all the people in your state sort of working towards the same goal? Um, and, and really, that highlighted, and when Delaware spoke about the same sort of process that they went through, it highlighted for us that um, the key thing is that we were building on seven years and longer, but really the last seven years worth of policy level reform. Um, looking at um, having, and, and also coming from a position where we'd funded um, public education continually over that time period, even in really tough times, um, and are doing that again um, still in really tough budget times. But that we had addressed standards um, previously, that we had a data system that was already in place and we just had to turn it on and, and um, open up and unlock that data, that we had been in a position where we needed to look at what does it mean to have the state potentially take over schools? Um, how do you operationalize that? Um, and then also that we um, have spent some time, but maybe that the area that we really needed to spend more focus on was really developing teachers and leaders and doing that at the classroom and school level um, rather than just from the state perspective. So this Race to the Top was really an opportunity to take all the policy changes that we've made and try and bring it into the classroom and offer more resources to, uh, to districts and to teachers and to school leaders to, to make the changes that we, we know need to happen. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the legislative session and the importance of that um, within both um, the Race to the Top application but also for the state going forward. As Susan said, um, and I think the commissioner touched on this as well, whether or not we had won this competition, specifically related to teacher evaluation and related to turnaround schools, and specifically related to the Achievement School District, these were things we were going to do anyway. The nice part for Tennessee is that we had already started down the road and we're going to adopt Common Core Standards, being one of the requirements of, um, of Race to the Top that we were looking at how to do um, annual evaluation. In fact, the governor's office had received a grant from the National Governors Association um, last year to start looking at teacher compensation and teacher evaluation, and both Dr. Register um, and uh, TEA, Earl Wyman um, from TEA, had participated in that. So we'd already started having these conversations about how do you get to looking at annual evaluation of teachers, how do we start to look at strategic compensation, differentiated compensation, that sort of thing. The legislative session, the one thing the governor will say about it repeatedly is that the key to it was that it wasn't a Bredesen plan, it wasn't a Republican plan, it was not a legislative plan, it was not a TEA plan, it was a Tennessee plan. This was where Tennessee was headed and um, I think that was clear not only to people within the state and if you look at the votes within the session on um, sort of the overwhelming support but also then clear outside of the state, and I think that really helped to push our application along um, as well. So um, the, the keys to the legislative session really, the, that we've had the data um, on teachers for a number of years and on how students perform, and being able to tie the student level data to, um, to teacher evaluation is a key thing moving forward. Um, 
really a huge key was the partnership with TEA, and um, you'll hear that again and again, but it was really important to be working together and to continue to work together. Um, as we've stepped into the um, implementation and are looking at um, the, the development of the annual evaluation and, and what it means, um, we'll, we've developed that partnership further and will continue to. Um, the other, within the um, legislative session, the Achievement School District, which you all have heard a lot about, really was about giving the state the opportunity to do what it might need to do um, in a position where schools had gotten so far down the line that we need to take them over and just really clarifying um, the state's ability to do that. The other thing that we did was um, comprehensive higher education reform, and that I think was, was um, is a tangential thing but in, in the, the discussion of race at the top, but really important even from the Department of Education's perspective on being able to tie wholesale reform together. Um, I'll talk a little bit deeper about some of the reform initiatives. I've spoken a little bit about the annual evaluation. Um, the committee, which um, Dr. Register is also a part of, is in process of developing that evaluation. Uh, there will be guidelines that are adopted by the State Board of Education, um, and we will um, have all of that up and running by next summer. Um, I want to talk about professional development to, to an extent. We've really focused professional development on pre-service and in-service. Um, around standards um, and around especially giving people the, the data that they need in order to be able to make the changes that they need to make. When you start to base someone's evaluation on the data, on the testing that the students are doing, you then actually have to give those people the opportunity to really understand it. We put a, a huge amount of money into that. That's about getting um, understanding of data and, and what it means for a teacher into the teacher's classroom. Um, there are a number of different initiatives around that that I could talk more about. Importantly, for pre-service, it also means redesign of the pre-service programs. It means putting standards and data into pre-service programs, something we haven't done before. So teachers leave their training programs knowing more about how to use data and, how, and what the standards mean for them. Um, talk a little bit as well about um, an expansion of alternative licensure, which the governor had made uh, a key point within his um, policy platform over the last couple of years, and we've, we've ramped that up as well within um, the Race to the Top application to allow people uh, just, it's, uh, the opportunity in um, Teach Tennessee and distinguished professionals, sort of second career people, to come back and teach in the classroom. And then finally, um, compensation. Uh, we're sort of just heading down the road of what we do on compensation reform. Um, and that'll be the next initiative that we work on um, as we look towards a teacher incentive fund grant for the state. One last thing I just want to touch on really quickly is um, partnership opportunities. There is an RFP that's currently out um, on the State Department of Education website. If you or um, anyone you work with uh, would like to be a provider to districts of um, professional development services, um, please take a look there. We can talk a little bit more about that specifically. Good afternoon. I've been asked to talk about three things. The first is how the State Teachers Union and local affiliates came to support the uh, Race to the Top effort. The second is how the Race to the Top will help support the improvement of instruction in Tennessee. And the last is transition issues to consider with the new administration in 2011. Uh, the actual first part of it is pretty straightforward. Uh, we were an organization of about 51,000 teachers, administrators, and uh, pros prospective teachers. And uh, our primary interest is in how to improve teaching and learning conditions in the classrooms all over the state. Uh, we're always looking for good ideas. We're looking for freedom to try a lot of those ideas. Um, we are looking for opportunities for teachers to be able to hone their craft and to practice it without fear of uh, retribution or without uh, anything denigrating happening to, to their reputation because of it. One of the ways we got to this is because we trusted Governor Bredesen. For seven years, he has demonstrated that he has uh, an abiding concern in the quality of education in Tennessee and he has put his policy uh, muscle behind it. He has supported the funding of education at the level that Tennessee is willing to fund it. And uh, when he called, 
you know, we knew that the program was coming. He found out that the program was coming. And when he called, of course, we went. And uh, when we had our first meeting with the governor and some of his staff, uh, he wanted to know whether or not we were, would be willing to support an application to compete for that uh, money. And uh, we talked about the four assurances that were a part of this program. They are all assurances that we buy into, that uh, we care about. And frankly, we wanted him to be able to be successful if we could agree to it without, of course, hurting teachers. And if it had any chance of improving uh, the plight of teaching and learning in schools, we wanted to be a part of it. So it was really him that attracted us to it. And it was his, uh, our trust of him that resulted in us staying to the table uh, until this was finished. And it was not an easy uh, process. Uh, we had a number of meetings. Uh, sometimes we walked away from the table and came back and we talked about all of those kinds of things that had to uh, take place in order for this uh, application to be competitive. And we've done some things that a lot of organizations wouldn't do, that is teachers organizations, in an effort to make that application uh, more competitive. We recommended that every local affiliate sign the memorandum of understanding of every school system that wanted to participate. And that happened. I think we had maybe two or three that did not. And uh, we're glad now we got the money. So I mean, how can you argue with it? Uh, we are looking for those kinds of reforms that will have some promise of uh, strengthening those things that are already strong in public schools and minimizing the weaknesses. Whatever else goes on in this whole process, ultimately the success of this initiative, as well as every other, depends on what happens in the classroom between teachers and students. And if that does not change, or if that is not uh, productive, nothing else matters. And that's the way we approach it. And we think we've got a team of people who also believe that. Now, uh, how will Race to the Top support the improvement of instruction in Tennessee? I'm gonna tell you, and I don't know whether you're a believer or not, but you would be absolutely uh, excited if you knew how much of the teaching force in Tennessee are just very, very competent people. There is nobody sitting in a classroom who uh, says to themselves when they walk into the classroom in the morning, I want to see how many kids I can fail today. Everybody is looking for ways that they can help boys and girls perform better. They've dedicated their lives to it. You know, it's the old thing of if you had a ham and eggs breakfast, it's the teachers who bring the ham. And we're looking for ways to make that better. And believe it or not, most of the public does not understand how complex teaching is. In fact, a lot of researchers take a long time to discover what it is that makes one teacher different from another. And the latest thing that, that I've heard is that they actually uh, filmed teachers and then looked at their student performance at the end. And some of the differences are so subtle that even experienced educators can't pick it out. The vast number of teachers in the classroom have no dearth of skills. Very often, it's a dearth of the resources to inform their choice of methods. And we think that one of the things that, this, that the RTT grants will do, we hope, is to provide more resources. And that's resources in terms of time that teachers can spend with their colleagues. And that is in terms of professional development. Those of you who are in private business would think nothing of spending up to 25% of the time of your employees teaching them how to do something different if the industry is changing. We have a requirement in law that five days a year must be spent for teachers. That's just not enough. And then the quality of the professional development that they are provided is just not enough. We actually need a knowledge management system for, for teaching. If you look at medicine, 
a doctor who wants to learn a new procedure can go into a medical library and actually watch another physician doing it. We don't have that for teaching. There were some experiments with it in England, and we have a few places around the country that's trying it. But we need more of those kinds of things. The money from Race to the Top could help us to move along in that area. Um, the other thing I'm hoping that this will do is to result in some changes that will be lasting. You have absolutely no idea how many innovations actually take place in schools all over this state and all over the country in, uh, every year. What happens, however, is that you implement it, you don't fund it appropriately, you don't give enough time to it. And so when one thing is found to be an error about it, we throw out that and then we come up with the next initiative that is supposed to, to uh, you know, solve all of the problems of public education. That doesn't work. If this money is used appropriately and if we can get the kind of staff development and cooperation that we need, there is a chance that we will actually get some uh, lasting change. Teachers are hungry for it. The other thing I hope that this will do is give school systems and in fact make the state ask teachers what they need. Give teachers an opportunity to talk to each other. Teaching is not a telling enterprise. It's a problem solving enterprise. No teacher is successful with every child every day on everything. But we don't have time for most teachers to walk next door to another teacher who can do this thing they are looking to do well and watch them do it. Something as simple as that can make a difference in schools. You ask almost any teacher, what is the best professional development they can get? And they will tell you, meeting with my colleagues and talking to them about how to solve the problem with this kid or this small group of kids that I'm not being as successful with as I would like. Then the last thing, tr transition issues to consider with the new administration. Resist the urge to start over. Okay. Very often, particularly in the political arena, everybody who comes new wants to leave a legacy and they don't want to be identified with what the person who came before them did. But right now, we are talking about the most important institution in uh, the public sector. Resist the urge to start over. Look at those things that are working and keep them, but don't resist the urge to change those things you find that aren't working. Don't try to stuff a block you know, in a circle. It just doesn't work. And as soon as you finish, it pops out. Then the other thing that I hope uh, we will have to watch out for is to give the evaluation system that's now being constructed that will uh, come into uh, operation, will become effective on July 1, 2011. Give it a chance to work before you begin to make formative decisions with it. You're going to have to try it. You're going to have to have principals all over the state, in every school system, every school, evaluating teachers going to have to see what it means and see what the results are before you can de determine whether or not it's effective. All of this is really fairly simple, but it's also more complex than anything you've ever tried. And this gives us an opportunity to do some things that we've not done before. As the Commissioner said, $500 million when you're looking at a $6 billion budget is not a whole lot. But I sure wouldn't have turned it down. <laughs> and I think if we use it well, and if we engage those people who show up in classrooms every day, this could re really mean some great things for this state. Good afternoon. Often when you're last, uh, you don't want to sound like a broken record. You want to introduce something new. And actually today, it's pretty important that in some respects I sound like a broken record. But I don't want to start that way. So I think I'll drill into Metro Nashville Public Schools and talk about some things that are going on here first and then maybe sound a little bit like a broken record uh, before I finish. Um, let me say first that, that yes, uh, our estimated allotment is $30 million over the next four years. I will assure you 
that I've been given $100 million worth of advice uh, to use that $30 million. That, that amounts to about $7.5 million a, a year, and, and uh, Commissioner Webb gave us uh, a planning document about three weeks ago, I guess now, so, so we're, uh, we're getting into the middle of that. I want to talk a little bit about what we want in Metro Nashville and then talk about race to the top, if I may. What do we want here? What do we want in this school system for our young people? We want excellent classrooms, uh, excellent teachers in every classroom in this district, in every school in this district, every year. Uh, that's number one. We want excellent principals who are outstanding instructional leaders uh, in every school in this school district uh, every year. And we want an excellent support system uh, for quality instruction to support those teachers and, uh, and to work towards student success in our school system. Every year, every classroom, regardless of, of where that school is and which school it is. Last year, we initiated a very comprehensive uh, transformation strategy to achieve these goals. MNPS achieves. I hope you've all heard that. It's ambitious. It's urgent. It has many facets. It's complex. We've started an initiative to reform or to transform our high schools and our middle schools. Uh, we're, we're looking very seriously and focused on the education of disadvantaged youth, uh, students with disabilities, English language learners, which, in which we're unlike anywhere else in this state and in many places in the southeast, uh, for improving the quality of instruction for gifted uh, and advanced students uh, and, and other areas. Uh, we plan to attain these uh, goals that we have of improving instruction for these students through the effective use of data and technology, but primarily through the investment in people, a human capital development strategy, if you will. For us in Metro Nashville, Race to the Top is a tremendous opportunity that will enable us to reach those goals. Of course, uh, our course was charted. And uh, and if I use the whimsical side of me, I'll say the stars were aligned. If I use the business side of me, I'll say the state, federal, and local efforts are all, in, are all moving in a coordinated and focused direction. We are fo all focused on doing the right things. And I think I want to start by talking a little bit about that focused initiative and the partnership, if I may got a couple of examples I'd like to use that have already been mentioned. The first is one called the STEM initiative, Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. Uh, Metro Nashville will participate on the state side of that funding uh, as a STEM platform. Uh, we, 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 uh, written into the plan is a plan for developing STEM academies in our schools. Uh, we also have a partnership with Vanderbilt University to bring in science teachers and, and to partner with the science program at Vanderbilt in the STEM initiative with us. We're also writing a U.S. Department of Education Magnet School grant that includes three STEM academies uh, in that grant that we expect to get. And we've started a master's degree with Vanderbilt in, uh, in STEM, uh, in, in uh, focusing on middle school, science, math, and literacy teachers. I think that's a pretty good example of how we're focusing our resources from many directions to attain some very important goals. Uh, a big part of our initiative here is on human capital development. Uh, let me highlight the, the task force that we've formed, the joint task force with, uh, uh, with Mayor Dean. It's, it's uh, labeled ASSET. Um, that's a superintendent mayor joint task force. Uh, we, have, we have partnered with uh, uh, and, and are looking at the state evaluation system and tying our work to, that, to the development of a state evaluation program. Uh, actually, Ed First is facilitating that work for us. Uh, we're focusing on job embedded, school based professional development. Uh, our big initiative, where, where our direction is going, is on an investment in people. It's an investment in human capital. It's leadership development, building the, building the capacity of present leadership, developing a pipeline for future leadership, 
uh, and there are specific examples of, of ways that we are planning to, uh, to do this. Uh, one's a, for, for many of you who, uh, from the chamber who went on the chamber retreat to Denver, you'll remember a, a person there whose name was Brad Jupp. Uh, uh, he is now in the Obama administration, developed a great concept there, a career development academy. To, to focus on the career development of the very brightest young teachers that are coming into a system, those that are just attaining tenure. Uh, we, we've talked to Brad about starting a career development institute here so that we can uh, retain and keep the very brightest young people coming into the profession uh, in education through career development and career advancement. Uh, we've talked about the possibility of starting 400 model classrooms next year. This is an idea that we've not talked about very much out of the planning room. Uh, but focused on professional development uh, and focused on making technology an integral part of these model classrooms, state-of-the-art classrooms. Uh, technology is only one little piece of that, though. In, in addition to the technology, you've got to develop the people who are using those, those, uh, uh, that technology. Uh, we're very excited about the possibility of that. Uh, we uh, we, we uh, are uh, very interested in the partnership that we've formed and very excited about the partnership that we've formed uh, with a number of participants, and several of those participants are in the room for the persistently low-performing schools, particularly Cameron Middle School. Uh, Commissioner Webb and I started a conversation soon after, uh, or actually before, uh, the Race to the Top was funded about how to partner to raise the performance of students at Cameron Middle School. Uh, and it's a charter partnership, a unique one, one that's unlike anything else in the country. Uh, Lead Academy is our partner. Jeremy Kane's in the audience somewhere. Alan Coverstone's worked to develop this partnership. Uh, the Department of Education is a partner in this program. Metro Nashville Public Schools is not stepping aside. We are a partner in this unique possibility. I see Candace McQueen in the back of the room. Lipscomb University is a partner in this effort. The challenge at Cameron Middle School is the English language learner population that we have not served well. And Lipscomb University will help us develop a model for serving our English language learner children very well in that opportunity. Uh, th this is innovative. Uh, I'm excited about it. I think we're going to do some things there uh, that, that we have not done before. Uh, so uh, I think Race to the Top is a great opportunity for us. The advantage that we have is developing a partnership with the state, a partnership with the federal government, uh, it, I, and I hope I've sounded a little bit like a broken record. Uh, it is an investment in people. It is helping make all of our teachers successful. It is helping raise that standard so that our students can be successful. And with that, I'll stop and turn it back over to Commissioner Webb. You know, when I listen to these speakers, one of the things that comes from them to me is the trust that they have with everybody on this panel. I mean, these are the leaders in our educational system in Nashville, Tennessee, and the trust that they have in each other is really outstanding. And that's what made this partnership work, this partnership between the federal government, the state government, and the local governments that, and the teachers association. And I want to really give them a, another round of applause just for, just for developing that trust that I heard it spoke by two of you, two of you three times. <laughs> Anyone, any questions from me? I would like to hear what safeguards or what new thinking will be used in the implementation of those programs, obviously thinking long term, so that it is not a case of no children left behind becoming no teacher left behind. And the second question that I have uh, regards uh, ELL, how do you see um, um, ELL, ELL, ELL becoming a better instrument uh, for the advancement of our students 
because I mean I cannot I cannot uh, help to consider the question that isn't the best ELL program the one that makes ELL obsolete? Uh, I, I can address both of those issues, and I'll, I'll, I want to I want to start with the uh, teacher teacher training issue from a practitioner's point of view, not from a university point of view. Um, I think. That I want to make a statement that there is only so much that a university can do in four years, traditional or not, and, and produce a 21-year-old professional teacher. There is only so far that you can go. Where I think we've missed the boat in public education is that we've not created a support system for those people coming into the profession. That's, that's, that, that's very strong. We don't do what a lot of business and industry does, and that's really put a support system in place. Uh, and what we're trying to do in our, in our school system, and it relates to some other comments that have been made, is put in a support system in each school, school-based, job-embedded, mentoring and support system. Uh, that, is very, that is very strong. Uh, frankly, what I've seen this year from Teach for America has impressed me because they put in a support system uh, that, that we can learn from and that I think we need to do that. Uh, so, so what do we do, what do we do institutionally to work with teachers for five years? And, and a, part of our, a part of our planning process is to embed those, that support system in schools, not in a central office, not someone on a rotating basis to come in one day every month perhaps but to build that support system there. Um, and, and so far as the English Language Learner Program is concerned, we've, we, you're exactly right. Uh, we, we have to look at the, the model. We have to look at the way we're providing service. Uh, and, uh, and I think we've got a lot to learn there. We're just finishing up a study, a year-long study from, uh, with George Washington University, and, and we're receiving now some recommendations that will change the way we deliver education to our English language learner population. But I also want to say this about English language learner population. I go into classrooms where, where I see a large English language learner population. They're great kids. They're learning a lot. It's really hard to come into this country at age 14 and have two years to learn English and pass a test. And that's what we're asking of many children in the, with the current no child left left behind standards. That's not fair. I met with a group of uh, uh, young people yesterday uh, who were high school students, who were all English language learners, who were struggling with motivation and hope because they know that when they graduate from high school, their opportunities for college or university or meaningful employment are very limited because of the laws in this country. We have to look at issues like that. Uh, I met a young man who moved to Nashville when he was three years old, and he's a junior at Glencliff High School. Uh, and because he wasn't born here, he doesn't have the same opportunity that that my child has. Uh, he's he's uh, he's he's not he's not a registered, uh, so he can't get a driver's license and he can't go to a university without paying international tuition. We need to look at issues like that. Uh, and, and understand how that affects a dropout rate and a motivation rate for young people who come to us from different parts of the world. Commissioner, you have a comment on that? No, Commissioner. Okay. Ken McElrath with Scudat. And my question is really for Al and I think Jesse, and it relates to those five days for professional development. And I didn't really see in the Race to the Top application that there was going to be an extension of those days. Or how do you plan on fitting in more time for professional development? Are you going to extend the work year for teachers? Or are you going to, how are you going to manage that? I think the most effective professional development is uh, uh, job embedded uh, on site during the work day. Uh, and I think there are some strategies uh, that you can use to do that. And that's putting uh, uh, instructional expertise at the school level. Um, and it, it, it's also doing some other things like uh, having electronic, uh, uh, having electronic professional development. I, I think the biggest thing, though, to me is that professional development 
development needs to be determined by school faculties, by teachers, by groups of teachers in their own schools, looking at their own data, understanding their data, and understanding the strengths and weaknesses that they have school by school. Part of it's got to be um, system driven, but really what we have to do is provide opportunities for teachers to address the weaknesses and strengths that they see in themselves and, and in their teachers. And uh, so uh, we're developing a school improvement planning process that relies very heavily on using that data, understanding that data, and then developing professional development plans in, in the schools. And we need to buy more time. Uh, in Tennessee, we, we uh, cheat the school year, in my opinion. Uh, I came from North Carolina, and it took me a while to figure out why there was such a difference in how much time we had to use. And we have a 180-day school year in North Carolina and a 180-day school year in Tennessee. In North Carolina, they'll put you in jail if you don't do 184 days, or they'll, they'll fire superintendents. And all of a sudden, I realized the difference was to get that 180-day school year in in North Carolina, we had 12 more work days for teachers a year. Uh, that's an expensive proposition, but we need to look at time, and we need to pay teachers for the time that they develop themselves. Susan, did you have no, I was just, just going to piggyback on what Dr. Register was saying, is that a lot of these things are available to local choice. So school districts have to um, submit to the commissioner for approval a scope of work as to how they're going to be using their local share and how that local share and the way it's used aligns with the state plan. And so the, the things that you're hearing Dr. Register talk about are things that local districts have the opportunity um, to determine how they're going to make that happen. Now, some of those things are more expensive than others, obviously. Um, but depending upon the context of that school district, they're going to need different kinds of things in order to make that happen. And uh, the way you handle that is going to have to be systemic. And I think Dr. Register kind of hit it on the head. It needs to be embedded. I mean, a lot of it has to be interaction between people within the school during the school day. But the school has to be dedicated to it. A school has to be as dedicated to the improvement of teachers as it is to the performance of students. And uh, mentoring is a part of it. Uh, loosening up the structure. I mean, right now, we still have a number of periods during the day, and every teacher has to be in the classroom at this time, and when the bell rings, the kids go there. And there's a reason for that. I mean, there is a need for some control. So we've got to loosen up the structure though, so that the professionals can talk to each other. We've got to provide more support, not just for new teachers, but for also experienced teachers. Nobody in any business is consistently effective every day all the time. And a teacher can be very effective this period with this group of kids, and the next period get somebody that they just, they just can't figure that one out. And I didn't get to know that until uh, before I came to Tennessee. When I was in the classroom, my second job was actually teaching in Hebrew school. And I taught uh, kids who were going to be rabbis. I taught English subjects. I didn't teach Hebrew. But you find out how different kids can be and um, how difficult it is to make the right decision all of the time unless you've got someone else there who's done it and who can talk you through it. You know, I think another thing that's pretty important to note is I want to go back to something that Al said earlier, um, and, uh, and, that's, uh, and I'll use a different phrase, but it's focusing on best practice. Uh, when we develop an evaluation system, and these folks have heard me say this, there are a set number of, of uh, poor teachers in this state. We need to deal with them, but the great majority of teachers in this state are, are good teachers. And what we need to do is focus on best practice. The way you improve student achievement, the way you improve quality teaching is looking at the best and learning from them in a collaborative way. And uh, we, don't need to, we don't need to evaluate every teacher and every principal in this state every year for the purpose of singling out a few that are low performers. It's our fault. Shame on me if I don't deal with those. But what I want to do is focus on best practice and raising the standard of practice of the great majority of the people who work in our district. And that's, that's, a, that's a high yield strategy. 
Well, we thank you very much for being with us today, our panel. Uh, you have been very informative.